In this lecture, we will go over the CFA Level 1 reading on Demand and Supply Analysis. This particular reading provides an introduction to demand and supply. Subsequent readings get into more detail on demand, supply and other aspects. There are four sections in this reading. Section 2 is a short segment on the different types of markets. Most of this reading revolves around Section 3, which talks about the concepts of supply and demand. And then Section 4 deals with demand elasticities. First, a high-level introduction. Economics is the study of production, distribution and consumption. It is divided into two broad categories, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Macroeconomics deals with aggregate economic quantities such as national output and national income. Microeconomics deals with markets and decision making of individual economic units including consumers and businesses. Since microeconomics forms the basis of macroeconomics, our first few readings will focus on microeconomic concepts. Section 2 Types of Markets Broadly speaking, we will talk about three types of markets. Factor markets, goods markets and capital markets. Factor markets refers to the markets for factors of production. Factors of production are the things that are used to produce. The classic factors of production are natural resources, mineral wealth, raw materials and labor. The market where these factors are purchased or bought and sold are called factor markets. So for example, the market for unskilled labor would be one factor market. Goods markets refers to the markets for consumer goods and services. These might also be called product markets. In the goods markets, firms are sellers. So a firm will make cars, sell those cars. So that would be an example of a goods market or the market for cars where the car manufacturer or the firm is the seller. In the factor market, the firms are the buyers. I just gave an example of unskilled labor. So in the market for unskilled labor, you will have firms which are the buyers. Intermediate markets are where one firm's outputs are another firm's inputs. A simple example again from the auto industry would be where firm A produces windshields and the product that firm A produces is sold to firm B which is an auto manufacturer. So A's output windshields is an input to firm B which is an auto company. The product produced here could be called an intermediate product because the product produced by A is not ultimately sold to the consumer. What is sold to the consumer is the car which is produced by company B. Capital markets refers to the markets for long-term financial capital. The broad categories are shown right here. Firms can borrow money by selling debt instruments. The classic example would be a firm issuing bonds. So the market where a firm issues bonds and investors purchase those bonds would be a capital market for bonds. Firms issue securities and investors purchase those securities that also would be a capital market. And finally, capital market includes secondary markets where debt instruments and equity instruments are subsequently traded. And finally, capital markets also include the secondary markets where debt instruments such as bonds and equity instruments such as common stock are traded. In the secondary markets, the trades happen between investors. So the actual firm or the issuing firm doesn't directly get any money when a trade happens in the secondary market. This material is covered in detail in the equity segment of the course. To get a sense for the types of questions you might see from section 2, 
I want you to do example 1 from the curriculum. In section 3, we talk about the basics of demand and supply. Demand is the willingness and ability of consumers to purchase a given amount of a good or service at a given price. Supply is the willingness and ability of sellers to offer a given amount of a good or service at a given price. The demand function and demand curve. First, you need to make sure you understand and remember the law of demand. As the price of a good rises, buyers will choose to buy less of it. And as price falls, they buy more. So this is fairly intuitive. When the price of something goes up, the quantity that is demanded will come down. This concept will be explained in more detail. And the reasons for why this happens will be explained in detail in a later reading. Now let's take a look at the demand function, which is an equation. So the demand for a particular good, let's say good A, is a function of several variables. Let's say that the demand for good A is denoted by QD. This is a function of or depends on the price of A. So A being the good or the item that we are talking about. Also, the demand depends on income. Obviously, higher the income, the greater the demand. And the demand will depend on the price of other products, which are substitutes and complements. And we'll talk more about this later. Here is a simple demand curve. Say the product that we are analyzing is chairs. The demand for chairs is given by this equation and we've just made this up you can have other demand functions also but say in a given town we have consumers and we have suppliers the demand curve or the demand function for a given consumer is shown right here it is 10 minus 0.5 p p is the price of the product which is in this case chairs plus 0.06i, i is the income, minus 0.01 times price of tables. So PT is price of tables. Let's say that people generally buy chairs and tables together. So these two products are called complements. This negative relationship means that if the price of tables goes up, then given that people buy chairs and tables together, you would expect the quantity demanded for chairs to go down. So that's why we have a negative sign. At a given point in time, make an assumption that the income is fixed and the price of tables is fixed. So we can plug in a particular income level, plug in a particular price for tables and let's then say that this part of the expression turns out to be 90. Then we have a relationship between the quantity demanded of chairs and the price of chairs and that expression or the demand function is right here. Quantity demanded is 100 minus 0.5p. The inverse demand function simply expresses this equation in terms of P. If we do some basic algebra, what we can do here is say 0.5P is equal to 100 minus Q and then divide both sides by 0.5. You will have P is equal to 200 minus 2Q. This is called the inverse demand function. The demand curve is a graphical representation of the inverse demand function where on the demand curve we will have the price on the y-axis and the quantity on the x-axis. Here is the sample demand curve. So as I just said, price is on the y-axis. Here the price is the price of chairs and the quantity is on the x-axis. Given this equation, 200 is the intercept on the y-axis. So this point is 200. 
and the slope of this curve is given by minus 2 so the slope is minus 2 what that means is a one unit change in quantity causes a minus 2 units change in price or the other way of putting it is minus 2 units change in price or a decrease in price of 2 causes an increase in quantity of 1. Here we talk about changes in demand versus movements along the demand curve. When the own price changes, by own price we mean the price of the product we are talking about. Here we are talking about the price of chairs versus the quantity demanded of chairs. We've just seen that this is a downward sloping curve. Say we have a situation initially where the price is equal to 100. If the price is equal to 100, then the quantity is equal to 50. So that's shown by this point over here. Now if the price increases to 110, that means we are moving up, the price is up. Notice that now the quantity is lower. So here the quantity is going to be 45. Quantity moves to the left. We have moved from point X to point Y. This is a movement along the curve. There is a change in the quantity demanded. And I want you to carefully read this a few times and remember what is being stated over here. When the own price changes, that is the price of chairs, which is what we are talking about, and nothing else changes, then there is a change in the quantity demanded, which was a change from 50 to 45, and this is a movement along the demand curve. If there is a change in any other variable, then the demand curve will shift. So the question might come up, what do we mean by other variable? Remember, we said that the quantity demanded depends on or is a function of the own price. In this case, it would be the price of chairs. Also, the quantity demanded depends on income. It depends on the price of other related goods. For example, if people buy chairs and tables together, then the quantity demanded of chairs also depends on the price of tables and so on. By other variables, we mean variables other than the price of chairs. In our simple example, that would be income. It would also be the price of tables and then there could be other related goods. But let's just say here that the income increases. If the income goes up, then the ability to buy chairs increases. This will cause a change in demand. We can also say that the demand curve is shifting. So going back, income up, so the demand curve shifts. And I also want to draw a distinction between the terminology used. Over here, we talked about the change in quantity demanded. That's a movement along the curve. Now we are talking about a shift that is called a change in demand. And this is extremely important, so I will reiterate. Movements along the curve happen when the x-axis and y-axis variables, in this case price of chairs and quantity of chairs, when these two variables change and everything else is the same. If another variable changes, such as the income or the price of tables, then the demand curve will shift. You can think of the shift as being a vertical shift and a horizontal shift. So if you think of it as a vertical shift, the idea is this. At a quantity of 50, given that people now have a higher income, or actually here we are talking about a particular consumer, a particular person, at a quantity of 50, the consumer is now able to pay 
more because he has a higher income so that explains the vertical shift that is the interpretation of a vertical shift what about the horizontal shift here you can say that originally at a price of 100 the demand was 50 now that the income is higher we have a higher demand which is this point over here at a price of 50 and that higher demand is explained by the fact that the income is now greater i've already built up to this but let's just formally identify the factors which cause changes in demand so we've talked about income when income goes up the demand shifts northeast so we can say the demand curve shifts up or the demand curve shifts to the right if the price of substitutes changes then what happens let's say that we are talking about wooden chairs and a substitute is plastic chairs so what happens if the price of a substitute which is plastic chairs goes up then clearly the demand for wooden chairs which is the product that we are concerned with will go up so there is a positive relationship between the price of substitutes and the quantity demanded of the product that we are concerned in what about the price of complements here the table is a complement if the price of tables goes up then given that people buy tables and chairs together the quantity demanded for chairs is going to come down this means that we have a negative relationship between the price of complements and the quantity demanded of the product that we are interested in now i want you to do example two from the curriculum now we come to the supply function and the supply curve the willingness and ability to sell a good or service is called supply the willingness to sell depends both on the price at which a product can be sold and the cost to produce simplistically let's say that the cost to produce a given product is denoted by w as a firm you will be willing to sell a product if the selling price is greater than or equal to the marginal cost the marginal cost of a product is the additional cost of producing each new unit now if you can produce a new unit for ten dollars then your selling price has to be at least ten it would not make sense to sell for anything less than ten that's why we say that the selling price must be greater than or equal to marginal cost while we are discussing this slide think of yourself as the firm or the owner of a small firm which manufactures and sells chairs so the supply function for a particular good again let's say that that good is good a which is chairs the quantity supplied is a function of the price of chairs and then the cost of producing chairs this particular equation is called the supply function and it's just being given to you obviously every product will have a different supply function but let's say that the supply function for chairs is minus 300 plus four times the price of chairs minus 10 times the wage rate earlier i said that w is the cost simplistically we are saying that the only cost is wage that's why we are using the symbol w so this equation should make sense if the price is higher then obviously you as the firm would want to supply more if the cost depicted by the wage rate is high then you would want to supply less and that is captured by the negative sign if we use a given value of the wage rate say the wage rate is 10 then this equation simplifies to the following q is equal to minus 400 plus 4p if you rearrange this expression and write it in terms of p then we have what is called the inverse supply function 
if we do the simple algebra right here, we have P is equal to Q over 4 or 0 0.25 Q plus 400 over 4 which is 100. So this is our inverse supply function which is saying that the price of chairs is equal to the quantity supplied divided by 4 plus 100. The supply function or the supply curve now is shown right here. The supply curve is a graphical depiction of the inverse supply function. The intercept point is 100. The slope is 1 over 4 or 0 0.25. That means a 1 unit change in quantity corresponds to a 0.25 units change in price. As we did with the demand curve, here we will talk about changes in supply versus movements along the supply curve. The law of supply says that a rise in price will create or will cause a greater quantity to be supplied. And we already talked about this on the previous slide. You are the manufacturer of chairs. Obviously, if the price is higher, you will supply more. Now, let's talk about the movement first. So movement along the curve. This is where only the price of chairs and the quantity of chairs supplied changes. All other variables remain the same. So this movement is saying that if the price of chairs goes up, then the quantity supplied will go up, a movement along the curve. If the price goes down, then the quantity supplied will go down. Again, a movement along the curve. This is called a change in quantity supplied. Now, what happens if another variable changes? The other variable in this simple example is the wage rate. I talked about the wage rate being 10 on the previous slide. What if the wage rate goes down to 7? This will cause a change in supply, which is the same thing as saying that the supply curve will shift. When the wage goes down, then the supply curve will shift like this. This particular shift could be thought of as a horizontal shift or a vertical shift. To understand the concept of the horizontal movement and vertical movement, let's look at a few numbers. Say with our original supply curve, we are at this point where the price is 150 and the quantity supplied is 200. When the wage rate goes down, we can think of the following situation. At a price of 150 with a lower wage rate, the firm will be willing to supply a greater quantity. So that represents the horizontal movement. In terms of the vertical movement, think of it in the following way. Say the quantity is 200 and originally the price is 150. If the wage rate goes down, then the firm will be willing to supply 200 at a lower price. So that explains the vertical movement. Now do example 3 from the curriculum. Section 3.5 deals with aggregating demand and supply functions. Aggregating simply means putting together. So far we've talked about the demand for an individual consumer and the supply for a particular firm. When we talk about the market, we are talking about the collection or the combination of all the demanders, i.e. all the buyers, as well as the collection of all the suppliers, i.e. all the firms. We aggregate demand by adding all the buyers. This is the individual demand function for a particular buyer. If we say rather simplistically that in a given town we have 100 buyers and all have the same demand function. Obviously in the real world that would not be the case but in this example we will say for simplicity that we have 100 similar buyers. 
similar means that they have the same demand function. What is the market demand? All we need to do is add this a hundred times and since the demand is similar we can multiply by hundred. So the aggregate demand curve would simply be quantity demanded is equal to a hundred times this individual demand function. 100 minus 0 0.5 P. So the aggregate demand becomes 10,000 minus 50 P. This is the market demand. What about the aggregate supply? There again we simply add the supply function for all the suppliers. If we say that we have two suppliers of chairs, then we take the individual supply curve and multiply it by 2. This was the supply curve for a particular firm. Since we have two identical firms, we multiply by 2 and our market supply then is represented by this equation. Now I want you to do example 4 and example 5 from the curriculum. Market equilibrium. We are at market equilibrium when the quantity which is willingly offered for sale by sellers at a given price is equal to the quantity willingly demanded by buyers at the same price. This sounds like a mouthful but the concept is straightforward. If you take the market demand curve which we just created or derived and we take the market supply curve which we also just derived, then the intersection of the two curves represents the market equilibrium. And you can imagine on the exam that you will be given the equation for the market demand and you will be given the equation for the market supply and you have to then calculate this intersection point which will represent the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity for a given product. And let's actually do that. We have already derived the market demand curve, so that is this, and we have the market supply curve, which is given right here. The equilibrium condition is that we need to find the price and quantity such that quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied. So we do a little bit of maths. This is the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied and solve for P. When you solve for the price, you will get approximately 186.2 and then plug this number into either of these equations, you will get a quantity of approximately 690. So what that is saying is, if this is our market demand function, this is our market supply, then the equilibrium price is about 186 and the equilibrium quantity is approximately 690. And I emphasize here that to come up with the equilibrium, we need the market demand, which is the aggregate demand and the market supply, which is the aggregate supply. A few terms that you should know. Partial equilibrium analysis. Here we concentrate on one market taking values of exogenous variables as given. So here is an interesting term, exogenous. Just to explain this, I will also give you the other related term, which is endogenous variables. When you are talking about the market for chairs, the endogenous variables are the variables related or directly related to your model. So if we are talking about the supply of chairs and the demand for chairs, the endogenous variables are the price of chairs and the quantity of supply or quantity of demand again for chairs. That's endogenous variables. The exogenous variables are variables such as income, price of tables and so on. With a partial equilibrium analysis, 
which is what we have done over here. We assume that the income is given and fixed. We assume that the price of other related products like tables is given and fixed. So with those assumptions, the analysis that is performed is called a partial equilibrium analysis. General equilibrium analysis considers all variables and how they interact. So this is actually the more precise thing to do, but it is also more complicated because in a general equilibrium analysis, you need to consider how changes in one variable are going to impact another variable and so on. Other than knowing these definitions, I don't think you need to get into more details at this stage. Now do example 6 from the curriculum. The market mechanism. Market mechanism refers to the process that prices must adjust until there is neither an excess supply nor an excess demand. So let's look at the same example that we've been talking about. This was our equilibrium position where the price was approximately 186. Let's say that for some reason the price gets bumped up to 196 or let's say 190. Let's say that the price gets bumped up to 190. If this is the situation, then at the higher price, the demand will be low compared to the supply. We'll therefore have excess supply and the suppliers then will reduce prices to get rid of the extra stocks that are piling up and we will come back towards the equilibrium point. Here on the right, we have a situation where for some reason the price might be lower than equilibrium. In this case, the supply is going to be less compared to the demand. The firms will notice this and they will start increasing prices until we come back to the equilibrium point. Now do example 7 from the curriculum. A few more comments on market mechanism. The concept of equilibrium that we've talked about is stable equilibrium. Stable equilibrium is where you have a downward sloping demand curve, an upward sloping supply curve. So anytime you get bumped off the equilibrium for any reason, the market mechanism will ensure that we come back to the equilibrium point and we discussed this on the previous slide. I don't think this is overly testable, but there are some circumstances where you might have unstable equilibrium. This happens where both the demand curve and supply curve are downward sloping or in situations where you have non-linear supply curves. So let's say you have a situation like this. You have a particular demand curve that's downward sloping. And for some reason, the supply curve is also downward sloping. In such a situation, if you get bumped off this equilibrium point, then the market mechanism does not push the market back to equilibrium. The curriculum also gives an example of a nonlinear supply curve. So if you have a supply curve that looks something like this and a downward sloping supply curve, then we have two intersect points or two equilibriums. This particular equilibrium where the slope of the supply curve is positive, slope of the demand curve is negative. This would be a stable equilibrium because if we get bumped off slightly, the market mechanism will push us back towards equilibrium. But this particular equilibrium is not stable because if we get bumped off, then the market mechanism is not going to push the market back to equilibrium. The final point in this subsection has to do with price bubbles. Price bubbles have been observed at times in the real estate market as well as in securities markets. And with a price bubble, what happens is that prices go up to unsustainable levels. And when the bubble bursts, then prices come down very fast. Price bubbles usually happen when people base expectations 
of future prices based on current movements in price. If you take a situation where, let's say that in the real estate market in Dubai, we have a situation where the prices are going up and people perceive that if prices are going up, now then prices will continue to go up in the future. So what is going to happen to the demand curve? The demand curve will start shifting to the right because there are expectations that prices will keep going up. So more and more people want to invest in real estate in Dubai. The demand curve starts shifting to the right. At the same time, you have a supply curve. And if suppliers also believe that prices are going to go up in the future, they are likely to hold back. So the supply curve starts shifting to the left. If the demand curve is moving right and the supply curve is moving left, then notice what happens to prices. The prices are moving up. As the bubble forms, this movement keeps taking place until some sensible people realize that this movement in price is not sustainable, maybe not explained by the fundamentals. And when people start realizing that, that is where the price comes crashing down. And we say that the bubble has burst.